Check. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today's guest is Anish Kaushal, and he actually is a VC analyst. And so basically, he looks at medtech ventures and uh, decides if they want to invest into the companies that are you know, trying to make these ventures. Um, they haven't necessarily done anything in neurotech right now, but they are looking to expand into this Amplitude VC or Amplitude, um, yeah, venture capital. Uh, but it was really interesting to talk to him to learn about kind of what they're looking for and the way they look at things and and uh, basically how you can earn the most money, like get, get the best um, get the best terms and everything like this. So I thought this was really interesting. We started out with his story a little bit and then how he switched from you know residency, being a doctor, to uh, working as a VC. Enjoy. Okay. Anish Kaushal, uh, pleasure to have you on the show. You are an analyst at Amplitude Ventures, and uh, that's a VC fund that uh, invests in, you know, medical uh, medical stuff. And, as, and you guys are looking to invest into um, – Neurotech as well. I don't think you've made any Neurotech investments, maybe that are public yet so far, but uh, are looking into it. So, so I wanted to bring you on the Neural Implant Podcast to talk a little bit about what you look at when you look at uh, investing in a Neurotech company. So first of all, thanks for coming on. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Leighton. Really appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, thanks for the quick introduction. Uh, as mentioned, sort of uh, work it uh, as an analyst at uh, Amplitude Ventures. Uh, so my background is actually as a physician. Uh, so I grew up in the uh, Toronto area, but ended up doing my medical degree out in the UK. Uh, so spent about uh, six years out there, also doing uh, clinical electives uh, out west in Canada uh, at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, uh, and then a number of research projects around the Toronto area as well. Uh, so following my time in medical school, decided, uh, ended up not uh, continuing to, to do medicine and, and sort of pursue the residency. Uh, so actually moved out to Amsterdam uh, to work with a group called uh, M Ventures. Uh, so corporate venture fund of uh, Merck, a large pharma company who a lot of people have probably heard of. Uh, and, and they're known as EMD Serono uh, in the US. Uh, so spent some time with their therapeutics team out in Amsterdam. Uh, really, really enjoyed the job. Love the the work and sort of working at the, you know, what I like to think is the future of healthcare. Uh, and then, you know, ended up joining the Amplitude team in Canada uh, sort of a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, that's that's a little bit about my background. And, and you sort of, as you mentioned, right, so neuro, neurotech is definitely a, an area of interest for us and one that we're definitely exploring. And a lot of companies that we've sort of seen in the last couple of uh, particularly weeks, but even the last few months. Um, and so, yeah, we haven't haven't made an investment uh, yet, uh, but it is definitely something we're, we're uh, monitoring for sure. Interesting. Yeah, I want to dive uh, into this uh, personal backstory a little bit. So, so you started out, you know, being a physician. Uh, like, was it actually like you were you were already ready to be a physician? Then and then you realized I don't like this, or, or what was the story behind that? And I mean, I bet a lot of people probably didn't like that you went, you know, from this altruistic thing to this like you know capitalistic thing. What, what was what was their opinion on that too? Yeah. So yeah, let me. Uh, I can speak first uh, on the first question, which is sort of yeah, how did I come to it? So so I I before I got into medical school. So when I was in high school, I was sort of my entire life always considered myself and wanted to go into the sciences. I always you know was good at math and science and thought that was the way I was going to progress. Uh, and then it sort of got to uh, high school and started taking actually business courses, so accounting and economics specifically. And so I realized that oh, you know, the world is much more interesting than you know cells on a on a plate or you know what uh, chemicals are, are sort of you know going in a beaker. Um, so I I then like at that time was applying to business programs as well as science programs uh, and was just very fortunate that you know I got an opportunity to study medicine right out of high school uh, in the UK and I thought you know it's a, it's a great university so the university I went to was you know a top 10 medical school at the time uh, in, in the world and also you know it was a chance to leave home and you know be in a completely different country and, and sort of all those things so that was the idea going in but I always knew that medicine wasn't going to be always the be all end all and like there's other things that I wanted to do with medicine whether you know it be outside and, and I didn't really know I just knew that medicine wasn't going to be everything um, so then fast forward sort of a couple years you know, was very focused on medicine, continued to do research, um, you know, got published in a number of journals uh, sort of throughout, uh, did all the clinical electives that I had to. And then towards the end of my time, I was just starting to realize like, you know, a hospital environment wasn't for me. I, I didn't like, you know, really, really enjoyed it. And I never woke up one day uh, sort of thinking like, you know, I really love what I'm doing. Like I, I wake up and I'm like really excited to sort of go into work. Uh, and so that was when it sort of, I would say beginning of my final year, I started to explore other opportunities, just started to do some research on like, you know, what could, uh, you know, medics uh, and scientists just do in general? Like, are there other careers out there? Uh, and I got some really good advice from my dad, who was a, a banker in the, in the biotech industry previously, who kind of said like, hey, you know, medicine is great, but there's also a lot you can do with that, right? Like that, 
degree and the knowledge that you gain is very valuable to a lot of people outside of just being in a hospital. Uh, and so anyway, so yeah, I started to sort of explore that opportunity. And then when I graduated, I actually like there was no job coming out of it. I, I didn't really know what I was going to do. But I knew that medicine wasn't it. So I actually had signed up for um, a master's degree in London, actually at, uh, at UCL. Uh, University College London in, in a degree in uh, drug discovery and pharma management. Uh, basically, the idea being that um, I was going to go into the sort of the far, like do this master's degree it was one year at the time, and then go into work in the pharma industry. Uh, and I had a friend who had actually completed the program, really liked it, you know, a lot of uh, talked to this uh, program director, a lot of people graduated after uh, sort of, you know, went into industry after. And so I thought, okay, this is a great transition, like I did my six years of medical school, like it's, it's fine. Um, and so at the while I was doing that, I also had applied to um, uh, just started applying to jobs. So, you know, sending emails to as many people as possible, trying to, you know, have conversations with as many people as possible. Uh, and I got rejected, obviously, like, you know, as, as I think everybody does when they're first finding their first job, uh, they, there was just like, you know, there was nothing there. And so then at the end, my, my dad kind of said, hey, have you ever looked at this thing called venture capital? And at the time, like, I never really knew about it. Like, my understanding of venture capital was like watching a show Silicon Valley, uh, which some people might know, but, you know, like seeing the guys there and like, you know, thinking of Uber and Twitter and Facebook and all these other things. So I didn't know that there was like this whole healthcare uh, side of it and where you could invest in sort of early stage healthcare companies. Uh, so that was really interesting. And then what I ended up doing was just, you know, sending cold emails to about, I think it was like 75 uh, venture funds around the world, um, just, you know, with a sort of application kind of saying, hey, you know, just graduated, we'll love to have a, a conversation, uh, just because like, you know, I'm looking to understand like this industry better. Um, so yeah, you know, most people don't respond as, as I'm sure my, you can imagine, but a couple of people did. And I was very, very happy that, you know, a couple of people wrote me nice emails, got on the conversation with a few people. And then one of them just so happened that, you know, they uh, had a fellowship program. And so they reached out to me uh, and this group in Amsterdam and ventures and they said hey you know we saw your application like you know we have this fellowship like we think it could be interesting what do you think so yeah I went through a couple rounds of interviews with them and then it was actually two days before I was about to move to London so I was like prepared I was ready I was like getting you know packed up and ready to go and they said yeah we're, we'll see you in Amsterdam and so that was like a whole cascade of events to try and you know shift everything to then move to a country that you know had only been two months <laughs> and then sort of like tried to figure out like you know phone and um, bank and you know where am I going to live and all these other things so so yeah that, that was sort of how I got into to VC, I would say very non-traditionally um, and not something that I had planned for at all. Uh, you know, not, not something like, you know, I, I, I speak to kids now, they're like, oh, you know, I, I, always, I always know that I want to do venture. And like, that was definitely not on my radar at all uh, when I was in school. So yeah, I just, I, I feel very fortunate to, to have, yeah, been in uh, and gotten the opportunity. That's really cool, actually. I didn't know this would be such a focus of this episode, but like, uh, it's really interesting that you, you know, kind of wanted to pivot. I mean, to use, you know, uh, kind of Silicon Valley parlance is, uh, you, you tried to pivot like after, after you've already, you know, spent six years in, in residency and, and kind of doing that. And, and and, uh, you know, didn't get much of a, you know, feedback or something like this. So I feel kind of the same way. I, I did my master's and I'm like, oh, I, that's not the direction I wanted to go. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to go back to that thing I was doing before. And yeah, same thing. Yeah. I mean, with no experience or nobody knows you, you know, it, it's really, it's really hard to get somebody to answer. So hence the podcast, but, uh, no, it's really cool. So, <laughs> so if people are, find themselves in a similar position, like w you, you would just recommend just blasting everybody and then, you know, kind of a law of numbers thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's definitely part of it. Because I think the way I always thought about it was just like, you know, all it takes is one person, like all it takes is one opportunity. And the way I saw it was like asymmetric risk, right? Where so like, I, the way I always think about it in my own head, and I think I've, I've sort of been trained by my parents is like, what's your upside? What's your downside? And you always protect for your downsides so that you make sure like, you know, you're, you're okay. And for me, like, when you're reaching out to people and when you're going to sort of going into a new industry or going into a new topic area or trying to sort of find somebody, cold emails are like the highest asymmetric upside like ever. Because to me, the, the way I, I think about it is like if you send an email to somebody and the worst case scenario is they don't respond. Right. And so like you're exactly where you sit and you're exactly where you are. And that's fine. Like because, you know, nothing's up. But the upside is infinite because like, you know, you could get connected to somebody that connects you to somebody else that, you know, sets you up. And like, for me, it was like, it completely changed the trajectory of my life. And like, you know, I got to, you know, have this experience in Amsterdam, get into this industry and venture. Um, also like just very seamlessly out of medical school, which I think is very rare and, and you know, doesn't happen to a lot of people. And, you know, I, I think for me, like, that's the way I think about it, where, you know, if, if you're somebody that's looking to pivot, I think, um, yeah, you know, sending emails for sure, like, you know, send to people. But I think the important thing also is like, just do your homework. Like, this is the other thing I think a lot of people don't do at the initial stages is like, like, you know, when you're reaching out to people, like, obviously, you know, cold email is very important. And it's more of an art than, a, you know, a science, like, you know, you have to figure out what you want to say, and you know, how long it is versus how short it is. But even before you start, like, do your research, like read about like the topic area that you're going into, like, if it's venture, like, for me, it was like, I was looking at venture, I was looking at consulting, I was looking at banking. And so it's like, okay, like, you know, go online, like, 
what is investment banking? Like, how does investment banking work? Like, you know, what, how does the structure work? Like, how do teams work? What is their job? Like certain questions where like, you know, particularly I think from coming from the science area, which I'm sure like, you know, a lot of you listeners are, listeners are, um, which is like the, the, the sort of worlds that you go into are very different than the worlds that we know. And I think like just learning about like all this information is available on the internet. Like you can go online, you can just sort of read like a bunch of posts. And so I would recommend like, you know, do your research first. And then when you're ready to like pivot or go into something else, then it's worth reaching out to people. Then it's worth, because then like, you're also more informed and like when you ask them questions about themselves like and about their industry like you know what you're asking and like you know what they're like you know you you can get better things and it's a better conversation right because like you know you and i both know we've probably had people that we spoke to that have no idea what we do uh, or no idea what's going on and they ask you questions you're like this is not relevant to me at all you know what i mean like and, and it just kind of you know lessens the conversation the person doesn't think of you as highly uh, and so yeah i would say like definitely the research part of it but absolutely i think you know cold the art of cold emailing is is one of those things that i think if, the way i think about it is if you're persistent enough uh, and you email enough people people like somebody's going to want to respond right especially if you word it in the right way uh, and so like you never know where that can lead to so yeah absolutely yeah definitely and then follow up emails as well because it can you know fall through the cracks so yeah. uh, that's definitely absolutely. huge as well but yeah, definitely. I, I think it's. Uh, I think exactly what you're saying. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm experiencing it from the other side a little bit now too. But uh, yeah, if somebody's thoughtful, if somebody's put some research into it, uh, into you know an interaction or an email or something like this, it really, you know, it just it it it, st- it stands out. And uh, yeah. you know, then then you you might start to think like, well, this this person's pretty intelligent. Like uh, maybe maybe we should uh, bring them on or you know introduce them to somebody else. So I think that's a I think that's really really good advice. Okay, so. Enough about you, enough about like how to pivot and how to yeah. go into uh, uh, the, the field. Um, first of all, let's let's talk about venture capital. How is venture capital yep. uh, different in medtech versus Silicon Valley, like the, the Twitter, Uber and everything like this? How accurate yep. is the TV show? And uh, uh, I don't know, what, what are some kind of tips for breaking into this? Yeah, so so VC, I would say, uh, I would say very different than the, the Twitter Silicon Valley, I think type of thing, because I, I think it also is the way the structure of, of the fund. And I think this is important for like, you know, if you're, if you're a company, if you're somebody looking to get in, it's just like really understand like, the structure of like how VCs work. So for example, like the Twitter and the Uber, and all these people that are mostly in the tech industry, like the way they're structured, depending on it also depends on stage. So I'm, I'm more speaking about the sort of the early stage venture capital side. So if you're in tech on the early stage side, like, you basically the way I like to think about it is like the spray and pray approach, which I, I like to call, but which is basically like you invest in 50 companies and you basically hope that like one of them hits out of the park because the way it works and, and it, there's something called like the power law distribution, which is like, you know, your winners are the reason like, you know, all, you, you return all your money and like your losers sort of die. And so the way I think most VCs think about it is like, let's say you're a $5 million fund. If you write like, you know, half a million dollar checks, like you're in 10 companies, right? But if you write $50,000 checks, like you're in hundred, right? So like there, there's a huge difference in that. And so the way I think about most VCs, particularly the ones in the Valley, particularly ones that have been super successful and other ones that have like, you know, had incredible returns. It's just like, they invest in everything, like everything they can get their hands on. That's like, you know, reasonable that like it's early stage has like a good team, maybe a concept at that point. Uh, and then you just, you know, chuck money out and then they go versus I think as you get into the later stages, which is like series A, series B, series C growth equity, then it becomes much more revenue focused, market driver focused. What's the future? Like what are the new areas of industry, new areas of business, all these other things. Um, so that's the way I think about it in terms of tech. And also like the, the, the way I think about tech is like you can value companies based on revenue, right? So like, you know, I, I know like, you know, how well this company is growing. I can see their growth over time, like how many more customers, all these other things. In healthcare, it's very different, right? And, and I think med tech is more similar to, to sort of the traditional, but biotech is very different because like you don't have any revenue until the device, like, you know, a drug is approved, like, 10 years maybe down the line. Um, and so the, the way you value companies and the way you think about companies and science is different than, than it is in, in traditional uh, uh, VC. Um, so so that, that part of it is definitely different and, and also depending on stage, right? So, you know, investing now at the early stages versus sort of the later stages, different type of capital that's coming in, different type of requirements, like, you know, and it's also a different type of science, right? So for example, the early stage venture, the venture people like us are like, you know, looking at, you know, stuff that's written in papers and academic journals that, you know, scientists are working on experiments like actively right now. And we're starting to think about, okay, like how can you put this in a way that like, you know, you can get this into patients, what diseases are most relevant, for example, Example, uh, versus like if you have the public markets people or the growth round people, you know, now I would say it's more they're coming a bit earlier. So they're coming more in sort of the early stage, but it's mostly been around clinical trials. So they're assessing like, you know, does this drug work? Like, has it worked in patients? Like, what are the clinical results? Um, and so that that part of it. So I'd say like, yeah, overall, I think the the, the types of diligence that you do is, is also a little bit different just in terms of how you value it. And also like, we're not taking the spray and pray approach, right? Because like, 
healthcare is much more obviously capital intensive. People realize like, you know, in tech, like a lot of times you, you may just need, you know, a computer and some software and, you know, you can sort of go and, and create this amazing company. But in, in biotech, like you need potentially millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to get through clinical trials, right? Uh, and so that has to be financed. And so when we take bets and we invest in companies, it's a, at a much smaller scale. So we don't invest in 100, we'll invest in like 10. Um, and, and you also have like other, you know, type gr- growth investors who are raising, you know, billion dollar funds who may invest in like 20. So that, that that's telling you that they're putting like 50 to $100 million of capital, like in a single company, which is a lot of money, obviously. Uh, and you want to make sure that, you know, you're doing your homework and you're in your investing because also the thing in biotech as well is like that money could theoretically disappear overnight, right? Like if you have a bad clinical result, the the risk reward, like it's very high, but like it could, it could all go. Um, and so, yeah, I would say those are, those are a couple of the, um, of the, the sort of, yeah, sort of similar similarities and differences, I think, between sort of the tech world and sort of the, the biotech and, and sort of therapeutics world. Yeah, it's a, that's really interesting. Uh, distinguish, um, you know, distinguishing of, of you know, the, the two two sides of it. Uh, I, I definitely think of VCs, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, they're kind of buying lottery tickets, you know, and, and they don't really necessarily yeah. care, you know, okay, the, the lottery tickets cost something, but if they get the money for the lottery ticket back, it's not a big deal. But that one lottery ticket could be a million dollars. Um, and yeah, but but it sounds like this is a little bit less. So this is maybe like, I don't know, scratch off cards or something like this where you want a thousand dollars, but you know, the higher, but you say have to, but you somehow, I don't know, are able to, to determine if it's going to be a winner or something like that. So you guys, do, would you say that you guys put more research up front into it? I, I would say so. I, I just, I mean, I think in terms of just like, like timelines, right? So for example, like when we spend time on researching a company and like doing diligence on a company, like it'll take us like potentially a couple of months, right? Like, and also even like a year, like we've, we've done diligence on companies that like will take a long time. And, you know, there's obviously, you know, negotiation that goes have to, has to go back and forth and syndication and like bringing other investors and all these other things that have to happen as well. But in terms of research into a company, yes, it can be a very long time versus like I've seen tech companies, for example, or like heard about tech companies that I'm sure a lot of people have, like I've seen on Twitter, for example, it's like they met the founder and then like the same day they're issued a term sheet or the same day they're like, yeah, here's like a couple million dollars. And I'm like, that, that is like in our, in our world, like that is, that is not, uh, that is a, cra- a crazy thing to think about. Um, so yeah, I, I, and I actually think like the, the analogy you gave is actually quite an interesting one, which is like, yeah, the, the sort of lottery versus, um, you know, spending a little bit more time, which like for us is like, because we're putting up a, a lot more capital, like we need to make sure that capital is covered. Like what's, and, and everything is obviously downside, right? Like that's VC's job. Like obviously upside is great and we're all looking for that. But at the end of the day is like, okay, like, is this something? And that's why I think you're also seeing the shift now for VCs, at least investing in therapeutics. And even I think in med tech as well, which is like looking at platforms, right? Or sort of like devices or things that can create multiple different products or multiple different technologies. So in med tech, for example, like, you know, a company that has one device in one indication, their upside is sort of capped at X, let's say, right? But if you have a, a device that can do like, you know, three different things or four different things in like 10 different indications. And like, even though like, you know, it's harder to prove out the money, you know, you need to obviously, you know, do the clinical trials and validate that in each approach, the the potential is higher. And so VCs look at that and are like, okay, this is quite interesting. Um, uh, or more interesting than sort of a single asset, single uh, sort of, you know, indication type. Play. And it also, the other thing maybe to add to that is like, it depends on the VC group and it depends on their strategy. And this is why, like, you know, maybe for, for some of your listeners who are listening to this, I think the other important thing I would say for uh, investors, uh, but entre- even entrepreneurs as well, is just like when you're raising money, like, understand and it's important to ask questions about the VC and like ask questions about like their strategy, their timeline, like when they invest, how how much they invest, uh, how long they want to be there for, like what's their, you know, exit strategy, for example, like, because you have, for example, crossover investors who are very much like, we want to get in and we want to be out within a year or two years, right? Versus like the VCs are like, oh, no, we're here. Like some VCs, like for us, for example, we're like, you know, we're in for 10 years. Like, uh, for example, some of my, my partners have been managing a previous fund, and like they invest in some of those companies, like, a decade ago, and they were still managing like, you know, the like what's happening and what's going on and still keep them up to date on, on everything. So it, that that also, I think that factors into it. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Like in terms of just diligence and the amount of research we spend, I think it's it's a little bit more for sure than, than the tech guys. Well, let's hope they don't hear this, uh, <laughs> this episode. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All good. So, okay. So w- you, diligence for, you know, six months or a year or, or something like this, what, what are you doing during that time? Like what, uh, what takes so long? I mean, you obviously have to learn the science and everything like this. Uh, and, uh, what are you looking for, I guess, as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think, and again, this is, this is, I think the VC answer that I always like to, I think thing is it always depends, right? Like, so like, you know, I say it's sort of six months to a year, like, you know, we've done deals where, you know, you can do it within, 
maybe like six weeks, right? Versus like three months versus like six months. So I'd say like, it really depends on the opportunity really also depends on the, on the venture group. Like, you know, you do have, like, I've heard of, uh, just through the great fine and sort of like following biotech Twitter, which is like, you have VC groups now, like a crossover investor groups that because of how well they've done on the public markets and the exit side in the last like couple of years, who are not doing even diligence on crossover opportunities, right? Where they're putting up $25 million. And because the partners like they have to, you know, because if you think about VC, the structure of VC, if, if you think about incentives is to like, you know, continue to deploy money, so you can continue to raise money from investors. And obviously, like, as long as you have good results, investors are willing to back you. And so there's actually like this is the incentive structure is technically to get out earlier, right? So the more money you can deploy, the faster you can deploy, the more money you can raise subsequent fund, the more fees you can charge, the more capital you can bring in, the better the reputation and sort of like this positive feedback cycle obviously it goes negative, to like, you know, the more failures you have. But I think these days, like, particularly the last couple of years, like everybody's done very well. So like, I've heard, for example, crossover investors who are like, you know, writing checks for $25 million that like don't do very bare diligence. Like, and to me, I'm like, that is crazy to think about. But it's also, the, I think, a, a structure of the environment that, the, that we're in and, and whatnot. But I think if you're so, yeah, so in terms of your question of like, you know, what are we looking for? What are we doing diligence on? Like, there, I think there's a lot of things, um, you know, team, obviously, you know, sort of at the heart of it and, and sort of, you know, who, are, who is the team? What have they done before? Uh, you know, have they, have they, you know, built successful companies before? Have they had exits before? Uh, have they worked, have this team worked together before at, at sort of previous ones? Um, what is, what has been their track record? Um, you know, science, obviously at the heart of sort of everything is like, you know, what are they doing? Like, how is it different? Is it like, you know, a sort of stepwise approach from what's currently in practice? Or is it like, you know, a ground? breaking thing that like you know could completely change the way medicine is done um you know manufacturing for example like you know how much you know how much time do you spend on manufacturing like i think more relevant to med tech like for example business model right like how are you selling um you know what is the sales cycle um you know how long does it take uh, is it hospitals versus, you know, uh, surgical centers? Uh, is this a consumer facing product? Who are your customers? Is it doctors, for example? Is it insurance companies? Um, is it hospitals? Um, so like all, all these things I think uh, are important as well as just like, you know, general like business stuff, right? Which is like, you know, you know, how, how much company, like how much capital do you need to raise? Like, you know, what's your burn rate? Uh, you know, where's this going to get to? What are the milestones? Like, what are the next things? I think like the most important, the way I think about it is like the most important things that investors want to know is like, if I'm putting my money into like today, how much value are you going to generate with this money? How long is that value sort of going to take to generate? Um, what are the sort of key things that we want to pay attention to? And sort of like, you also want to understand as well, like financing this, right? Like how much more money do you need to raise after this? Because like, you know, we've gone into company like, or, or sort of turn down deals, for example, because like, you know, we'll look at, for example, like a very large like indication area, like uh, osteoarthritis or arthritis or like diabetes, right? And you'd be like, okay, this person's like, oh, you know, we want to start a drug in diabetes. And it's like, okay, well, uh, if you understand, oh, and the market, I think the market obviously is a, is a big part of this, but like you, so you look at that market, you're like, okay, diabetes is huge, obviously massive market, that's great, but like how many technologies, how many companies, how many therapy, uh, uh, therapies, like how many things are in there that are already existed that are, you know, good, um, so like, what's, what's the requirement, right? And that's why you're seeing like companies raise hundreds of millions of dollars if they want to go after these big indications. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I think there, there's really a lot of things to look for. And, and obviously as, you know, VCs, we spend a lot of time just like, it's, it's more, it's just questions, right? Like we have a lot of questions that like, you know, come up on many different things. And I think this is why, like when you look at venture groups, like it, it's also nice to know like about like the structure of the venture group and like, you know, who they are and what they've done. Like for example, at, at, at our fund, like, you know, I myself, I'm a doctor that we have a number of PhDs on staff. We also have people who are CFAs um, and, and, you know, also scientists who have done masters and people from engineering. And so I think that like diversity really, really helps and is an added advantage because whenever we're looking at an opportunity, like there are many different sort of viewpoints and lenses is that we look at right versus like if you have you know a vc group that you're looking at that's like you know all people that are i don't know ivy league educated that like did it from x person's lab or like a bunch of different people's labs it's like that's great and like that you know they're probably extremely smart and there's a there a lot of vcs are very very smart people but like if you look at the team and the structure and like the types of questions they ask it's not going to be from the same lens because they just don't have the same amount of perspectives um so yeah i mean i, I like I, I mean i could spend <laughs> tons of time talking about a diligence process because like there are so many things that i think we ask and just want to validate and a lot of it is like to the company a lot of it is to ourselves and like you know thinking like okay you know how do we validate this like let's go to scientific research let's go like talk to kols and consultants uh, let's go sort of validate a lot of these assumptions ourselves um but yeah i think that that probably what i said is that it gives a flavor of uh, of what it is yeah and it's really interesting i mean a lot of what you say um i guess can't be changed uh, and I, I i guess i guess uh, my question i mean so this was this is great this is you know like really a deep dive into, into what you're looking for um 
what are the things that people can change? I mean, if, if somebody comes in, you know, like obviously maybe they're their idea or their indication, you know, like, is it a platform? Or is it mm-hmm. not? Um, that, that might not necessarily be able to be changed, but, but, uh, if, if somebody wants to be like the best candidate, what would be the best candidate for you? Yeah, I, I think it, it goes down to a lot to me is like presentation. Like I think the presentation aspect of it and like the reaching out and like the process that you run with the firms is just as important, if not more important than even what you're looking at. Because like at the end of the day, I think for VCs, what you what we think about is like, listen, like when like people have talked about this before, and, and I don't think this is a new idea, but like it's almost like a marriage or like dating at some point, right? Like if you get into like, you know, in, in investors and you pitch to investors, like, you know, if they hire like particularly ones like us who are, you know, institutional that want to be there for a very long time, like if they decide to sign terms and invest in you, like we're not here for like, you know, a year or like six months, like we're here for like potentially 10 years, right? And so like, we want to make sure that when we have a relationship, like everything's going right. And so like the, 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 if I look at sort of the best entrepreneurs, and again, these are, I think people that they just have so much experience that they understand the process, but even like for new people that I think about is like, you know, how do you present? Like, do you present well? Do you present your idea? Well, like, you know, do you have a really good understanding of, of what you do? Like, I also like to think about it in terms of like Shark Tank, right? Like I think an example that probably people know of, which is like, when you, when you see like a presentation on Shark Tank and you see all the sharks, you know, ask their questions, like they're obviously validating what they want to do, but the presentation aspect and the person aspect and the entrepreneur and who they are, that is really important, right? Like that part of it is is definitely a part of what they're doing. So I think like, you know, structuring the presentation in a way which is very clear of like, what's the problem? What's our solution? How are we going to make this better? You know, what's the product? What's the competition? What's the market? You know, how much money do we need? What's the amount of like the money that we're that we're raising to get to X point to build value? Um, you know, and just understanding like, you know, how long it takes to build these things out, understanding the regulatory process as well, like how how sort of, you know, difficult it is, particularly in healthcare, how long it can take, you know, do you have the right consultants? Do you have the right people that are around you? Um, so I think a lot of those things you can change, uh, which is just like, you know, how do you be a better presenter? And I think, you know, there are incubators and accelerators and all these things sort of online. They're like, you know, pitch deck templates and like, you know, people can go online and sort of look at, you know, what are the best ones? How should I structure it? Um, and, and again, it goes, I think, back to my question of like, it also depends on the investor that you're speaking to. Right. So, for example, like if you're talking to an uh, investor like myself. Um, who's, you know, more science focused, like I may ask a lot more questions on the science side. And so like, I may have a little bit more on like, you know, what is this? What is that? Versus if you ask somebody who's more of a generalist, like they might want to know the technology, right? So for example, like I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you an example off the top of my head, which is like, imagine you have an AI uh, uh, drug discovery engine, right? And so like you have this AI drug discovery engine where you're like finding new drugs or finding new targets to drugs. And so if you're pitching to a tech VC, they might be like, oh, like, tell me about your technology. Tell me about the AI. Tell me about like, you know, how does it work? How does the structure like, where's the data coming from, et cetera, et cetera. For us, it's like, well, tell me about like the targets you're going to find and like, how are you going to validate them? And like, you know, what's the science on like the, the new stuff? And like, if it's new, does that mean that it's better? Because like, if in scientific literature, if it's not validated, like, you know, we're not going to invest in that because like we haven't, or we, we don't know, like there's, there's just so much risk in that side. So um, I think, yeah, like in terms of, as you mentioned, like there's a lot of things that obviously entrepreneurs can't change uh, and in terms of the company and what they're doing and the technology and everything else, but the, the investor side of it, and also just like the feedback, right? So like, you know, following up with investors, right? Like sending nice emails, like, you know, having a very clear data room, right? Like, I, and I think the way, I, the way I think about a process, at least for us is like, you know, we typically get a pitch from an, an entrepreneur investor. Like we typically bring like my Myself and maybe a couple others, we have a pitch, it, then we review internally. Uh, and I think this is the other thing that I think is, you know, for entrepreneurs is, is nice, but maybe not too nice, not too far, which is like, be like persistence of like asking like, hey, you know, uh, can you provide feedback or like, you know, if they don't respond within like a week or two, like, hey, like, you know, just would wanting to check in, making sure everything's okay, just to find out, right? But also investors are busy, like, so like, don't, you know, pepper their inbox with too many emails. Otherwise, then that also takes them off. Uh, but then if you get to a point where, you know, they, they are interested, then it's like, okay, you know, we might want to send an NDA or like have a data room set up. And like, if you're an early stage company, like this is all very new. And, and I'm very aware that like a lot of people are not like, you know, what they may be asking, like, what's a data room? And, and for us, it's more like, okay, like, you know, can you like put all of these, like all the questions we have, all the central things that are, we want to invest, uh, do you have access to it in like a, a document somewhere that we can read, we can get access to? Uh, so for example, like regulatory, competition, market, uh, IP, um, you know, uh, finances, uh, you know, pitch deck itself, um, you know, valid, like maybe consultants, maybe you've had other people come in and validate like what you're doing. Uh, so all of these things, like, and just the process and like, you know, like talking to the entrepreneur understanding, like that part of it, I think is more changeable than, yeah, as you mentioned, like, you know, what they're, what they're doing in the market and all these other things. So it almost sounds like, I mean, if, if I have to distill that down, it's the people that make your job easy, uh, are the ones that you like. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, because I, I just, I think we're all human, right? Like at the end of the day, like the thing that I come back to is like, even though we're working early stage science and the cutting edge, like no matter what industry you're in, like it always comes down to people like a, a, everywhere you are. And like, you want it like for us, like we want our jobs to be like everybody, I think wants their job to be as easy as possible. Right. And so for us, like the way I think about it is just like, we want to work with people that are high quality people, high integrity people, people that are knowledgeable about what they're doing, understand the, the, the challenges. Right. Cause I think like you also get some people that you pitch through that like, this is going to have revolution revolutionize everything like we're going to take 100 percent of the market and like you know our our company is worth like 200 million dollars when they're like a science project and so also just like that that you know understanding of reality and like you know being based on like okay like this is very hard like science is very difficult like building a company is very difficult like particularly to, to me like the thing in tech and the thing in you know in if you have a product that's like a tech like a, an app for example or like a program or software right is like you you have to continue to innovate and you're and you you continue to work on it but it, you, like in science it's also different because like you're dealing with people like and human lives right and so like that aspect of it is very significant is very important it's very difficult it's very challenging to sort of get through all these different stages and so you just want to make sure you have people that like understand the process, understand the road, and are just good people, right? Like you want to deal with like sort of, you know, have and invest in good people around you for sure. Yeah, very cool. So what's, uh, what's exciting you nowadays? I mean, you guys haven't invested anything yet, but what what's kind of on your radar? Yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of things. Um, the, the thing that so I, I like to think about is like, for example, the well, the first fund that I worked for was very heavily focused in like a specific area. So we were only like at that time only focused on oncology. So like the only stuff that I looked at was cancer. Versus now, it's like we kind of touch a little bit of everything. So even though most of our uh, up to date now, uh, pretty much almost the entirety of our investments have been more therapeutics focused. Like we're still interested and we still look at medical device opportunities, uh, you know, uh, AI opportunities, diagnostics, digital health, digital therapeutics, and I actually think like what's happening on that side is is also really, really interesting. Like for me, one of the things I think about is just like the, the digital health aspect, right? Of like, you know, how, like, and I think neurotech is, is a prime example where like the the sort of blend between technology uh, and science is is becoming much more interesting because like, you know, everybody's using their phone right now. Technology is like, you know, completely exploded in the last decade. And so this bridge and this gap between like, you know, how can you give better care and access to patients that you couldn't previously before, right? So the way I think about it, like right now is, you know, you we, we've seen probably, you know, meditation for example, like a lot of people are getting into meditating apps, which like from a, a healthcare perspective is great, but from a business model and like a validation for us, like obviously doesn't make any sense. However, what you're starting to see now is like digital therapeutics, which is like, you know, we can create an app that's like a video game, right? Um, or like, uh, you know, a, a, a survey or like some, some like, you know, thing that they can do on their phone that like has gone through clinical trials, has been tested, has been validated against like drugs, for example, to show that like it's actually more beneficial. And like to me that like, you know, that's obviously a very interesting thing because like if you can open up that uh, market where, you know, like let's say I think about, for example, like let's say if you had an eating disorder, right? And you're an eating disorder and you were living in a rural area. And if you're living in a rural area, you don't probably have access to the care of like, you know, anorexic departments or psychologists or like, you know, psychiatrists who have, you know, very specialty in like a certain area. But if there's like an application or something that people can download and access and that you can get access to, for example, through your doctor, like that's really interesting because then you could get treatment and you could get something like through your your device or, and through something that's thing. And so like that access part of it, I think is really, really interesting. Um, on the on the therapeutic side, I mean, there are so many different rabbit holes I can probably spend and, and sort of go down. So I think, you know, a couple of things like cell and gene therapy are obviously some stuff that we're looking at right now. Um, I think like our sort of the basis and thesis of our fund is sort of precision medicine uh, with the idea being like, you know, the amount of data that all these like everybody's collected sort of over the last decade has been just astronomical and enormous, right? And so we're trying to figure out like, how can companies leverage that data, leverage that understanding, leverage the knowledge that's been built up in the last 10 years, uh, and sort of use that in a more patient centric approach, which is so like the way it, like the way I think about it in terms of medicine is like, medicine used to be like, you know, 50, 60, you know, 100 years ago, very doctor led. And it was very much like, you know, I tell you what to do, this is the treatment, like you're going to do it kind of thing, right? Then I would say in the last like 20 to 30 years, it went more evidence-based medicine. And we learned about this when I was in medical school, which is more like, you know, you present all the options to the patient and the patient makes the decision, right? And now we're sort of shifting into that point, which is more like patient-driven, which is kind of like, hey, like, you know, let's, you know, we'll check your, for example, like, let's say you get cancer, we'll check your tumor, like, you know, we'll do all the tests we can on your tumor to see what it looks like. And then we'll give you the exact drug that we know works for this tumor. 
right? Um, that is a really interesting. Or like, for example, if you have a specific disease or disorder, and like I can enter all these, for example, uh, questions or like answers into like, you know, a survey, I can recommend a thing that's like more specific to like what you need, right? Rather than a sort of generalist sort of thing. So I think that shift to precision medicine is the one we're most focused on and the one that we're trying to invest in, right? Which is, and even I think for therapeutics companies and neuro companies, right? Which is like, how can you make a more precision guided approach, which is not just like, let's say you have a, a bunch of companies who are, or a bunch of patients who have epilepsy, right? Like, okay, so that's great. The epilepsy market is massive. And like, you know, there are a lot of things that we understand in terms of like, you know, treatments for epilepsy. But like, is there a way that you can pick like a subset or a specific group where you know that the treatment that you're going after is extremely effective? And you can validate that through like data and you've done, you know, experiments on it and we know. And I think that side of it is more important just because I think if you look at the landscape of, well, one, like, you know, drugs and, and all the things, but also the insurance and payer landscape, right? Of like, you know, when you get reimbursement, like I think insurance companies are always looking for like, is the treatment going to work right like at the end of the day like that's what they want to know and they want to know through like health economics analysis like you know if they're going to pay for like you know are, is there money going to something and so for us like now just because of the amount of data that's exploded like in the next decade i think you'll see a lot of more opportunities like i think it started in, in oncology so it started in cancer but we're now starting to see it branch out into sort of other um you know uh, disease areas as well which i think is really really exciting for sure okay and then how about for uh, uh neurotechnology neuromodulation neural implants yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's just so many, like, I, I, I just started, honestly, if I'm being honest, like, in terms of like, looking into this area, like, probably within the last several months, I think, you know, the, the difference between the sort of autonomous uh, nervous system versus the parasympathetic and like targeting different types of nerves at different uh, points, for example, like, you know, we saw a company, for example, that was like looking at the vagus nerve, right. And I remember from my, excuse me, my time in medical school, where, you know, the vagus nerve is responsible for a lot of, you know, the like heart, and like, you know, your heartbeat as well as your blood pressure. And so like by targeting that specific nerve, um, you can modulate that where, you know, you can get it specific to like what the patient is feeling. So for example, like I know like one of the, one of the great inventions that basically catapulted Medtronic to where it is today, which is like, they took the pacemaker, then they added a sensor. And I, I literally found this out sort of <laughs> last week. I thought it was amazing, which is like, they took this thing called the active act sensor, I think it was called or, or something where they basically added it, where they tracked like you know, what the heartbeat was doing at different times. So for example, like if you're a patient with, you know, heart disease, um, uh, where like, let's say you're going upstairs and your heart is beating faster, the pacemaker can change like the amount that it, it sort of comes out so that like, you know, it, it, it makes sure that it can deal with the demand of your heart, right? And that catapulted Medtronic to like multi, multi-billion dollar uh, sales and like super success because like, and, and also if you think about it, it's just like a very minor shift. Like, like it's a very minor thing of like, you had this pacemaker, you had these devices that were, that were, and like a small thing that completely revolutionized everything. And the way I think about like neurotech is like, I mean, even like what Neuralink did, right? Like, I think, you know, this is probably hot news in, in the neurotech community in the last sort of a uh, couple of weeks. But like, I saw that video with the monkey and you're like, oh my God, like the, the idea of like sci-fi, like that, that those movies that we, like I used to watch as a kid where it's like, you know, you're implanted and like everybody's a kind of a robot, like it's, it's, it's coming sooner than I think people understand, which is like, you know, give it like, I mean, we're still very a long ways away from clinical trials and like getting sort of in a lot of patients and you help with patients. Like, but what Elon is doing with that is just one example of like, you know, be able to modulate and like control certain things, like having devices is amazing like it's just it's just so cool and like even stuff that i remember um looking at when i was at my my old job of like and and I, you know this was a couple of years ago and i'm sure now it's even progressed even more which is like you know modulating vision of like you know could we implant stuff in in you know your brain that's connected to your optic nerve and so for people that have blindness like we can genuinely like change the way they see and i'm like that is incredible just innovation and achievement and like you know things that like people were basically death sentences or like things that were like there was no hope it's now like oh, no, actually, we can use science and we can use technology and we can like help people see like that is just like uh, incredible. So, I mean, there are, I think there are so many different uh, rabbit holes and, and sort of things in, in the neurotech industry that like I, I've just started learning about uh, and sort of looking to look forward to it. And maybe actually I would turn this on you. Like, are there specific areas of interest and in you think in neurotech that would be you know worth exploring or, or things that are, are really interesting to you? Because you've obviously been in this industry for, for a very, very long time. So, would, yeah, I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, no, this is all this is all really interesting stuff, and and I mean, uh, it it's the the Elon Musk, uh, you know, monkey video like that. That is a uh, uh, the Neuralink monkey video. That it is like it's like okay, well, it, it's more of the same. Like that wasn't you know absolutely revolutionary. It had never been done, but it was just done to a better level than it had been done previously. Yeah, marketing was and great. the marketing was absolutely. great. Um, but I'm yeah. still you know I'm still a fan. But uh, for me, what's exciting uh, that's really caught my attention is bioelectronic medicine is basically being mm. able to modulate the the organs of the body 
you know, instead yeah. of pharmaceuticals. Or now they're saying, in addition to pharmaceuticals, and, and kind of what you were saying, this targeted medicine, uh, you could go yeah. directly for the spleen. You don't have to flood your body in, you know, biologics to or pharmaceuticals, you know, to to, yeah. to attack one little, you know, few grams of, of tissue or something like this. You could directly go to that, and and the the benefit to that too is that. Um, it's very time sensitive. So like you can turn off, turn off and it's on and off within a second, right? Versus a yep. uh, pharmaceutical yep. that takes hours to get through everywhere and, and, and it kind of floods 100%. the body. So that to me is the most exciting thing. Um, that That's what I really want to uh, see come to fruition. Um, okay. So uh, maybe for, for our last question, you know, as, as we kind of try mm-hmm. to, I, I try to respect your time and, and our listeners time. Um, what are some misconceptions or uh, what are some things that uh, people don't know about VCs and, you know, med tech VCs that they probably should know about or maybe that they think is, but it's wrong? Yeah, I, I mean, I think like this, this idea that I think investors are like bad people or like, you know, like don't want to help. I think like that that's just a, it's it's like don't get me wrong, like there are definitely people in our industry, but I think it's like any other industry, right? Which is like, you know, you have bad actors in sort of everywhere. And I think for us, like, you know, people are like, oh, they're like scary investors that like, you know, all they want to do is like invest money and like take your company away. Like, I don't think that's true at all. Like, yes, I'm sure there are some people that are like that, that are very predatory when they invest. But like, I think there are a lot of investors out there that like, at the end of the day, like, are you really trying to do good and like invest in like the future of healthcare? And like, honestly, like, that's the thing that I sort of came back to when I left medicine, right? Which is, as you mentioned, sort of at the top of the call, right? With this altruistic thing of like, you know, you were helping people to now like, you know, big, bad, scary investor of like going the more capitalistic thing. But at the end of the day, the thing I realize is more like, you know, we're in an environment now in, in North America that is very capitalistic. And in order for innovation to happen, there has to be some incentive there. And the incentive is obviously like, you know, massive gains and massive opportunity and like, you know, a big sort of payout at the end of it. Um, but and, and that sort of exists across everything. And to me, I think that the interesting thing now is like with investors is like they understand everybody understands like in order for all these innovations and all these ideas and all these things to translate from the lab or things in academia um, or ideas in people's heads in order to like patients is you need a lot of money. Right. And you need a lot of capital to, to sort of help get there. And so for us, like we want to be partners with everybody that we work with. Like we really want to help them. We're really trying to do our best to like, you know, make sure that we're thinking about in the right way and like, you know, uh, hiring the right people and like, you know, thinking like, you know, when we get on the boards of companies and like are involved, like, you know, what other indications should we go down? Like, you know, what is the strategy? Like, what are we focusing on? What should we, what should we sort of go down? Um, you know, what, what paths are, are the most important? Like who else can we reach out to? Like all these things I think are really important. And, and yeah, I think the misconception of like, you know, all investors are like, you know, or predatory or bad or like can be like, yes, don't get me wrong. There are definitely people that are in the industry who are absolutely part of that. And I also think like, uh, from my anecdotal experience of hearing it, I also hear about it from a lot of angels, for example, of like people that, you know, invest a lot of money sort of early stage. Um, and I think, it, it, to me and the way I think about it in my own head it's a lot of ego like you know people that have made a lot of money that are investing early that you know are investing like let's say 25 or 50 grand are like you know really want to like like have their imprint on it and, and go about it and like you know trying to get you to do x y and z um and and it's a lot just because like you know they're successful in their own mind and that you know think that like you know it's going to translate into what other people are doing um and and so yeah that I think that part of it definitely exists but for us like you know when you get it like when you get in touch with good with good VC groups and they are ones out there I think everybody's got to find them um it's just like you know, we really want to help. Like we're really trying at the end of the day to like, you know, help build value for everybody around the table. Um, like, you know, we, we are there, we are there for the long haul. Like, it's not one of those things that like, you know, we're coming in and out. Like we don't really care what's going on. Like, it's all good. Like, here's your money. Goodbye. Like at least for us and, and the people that I've worked with and the people that I know, it's like, you no, know, we like want to help. Like the, the whole point of what we're trying to do is to continue to build value. And like, for me, it's always been like to get to a patient, like at the end of the day, like science is great. And I know like there are a lot of PhDs and scientists that I know that are like, oh, I just want to advance science and see where it goes like that's never been my goal ever like I, like to me frankly like science is great like but academics like you know they have jobs for like to, to do all the science like my thing is like how is this going to help people like how is this going to help going to help like a person at the end of it who is going to benefit and their life is going to be more beneficial and the quality of life is going to be increased because of the thing that we invested in um so yeah i think that's probably the one of the biggest misconceptions that i want to get is like we're, we're not all bad people like i hope i hope this conversation is illuminated like you know we we're trying to help <laughs> we're really we're really trying. that's good yeah yeah okay i'll, I'll take your word they're not bad people but uh, no i i think i think you guys are doing uh, excellent work and and uh, you know that there's that that gap bench to bedside it's kind of the valley of death is what they call it a lot of people yes. say you know it's it's oh the whole thing's a valley uh, it doesn't get any easier but but uh you know taking taking stuff from again bench to bedside is is really difficult and and 
and God knows how many more lives or you know quality of life uh, could be improved if if that actually happened, and you know that the, yeah. the PhD project wasn't just shelved, you know, at the end of it, and they, they go the, the the student goes to work for somebody else. If it, it actually yeah. made it into the world, that that would, the world would be much better. So, uh, Anish, this has been excellent. I've really enjoyed this. Hopefully, our listeners have as well. Um, is there anything that we mm-hmm. didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? Uh, maybe talk about uh, uh, plug amplitude uh, quickly. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe just quickly. So, like, I mean, I guess if you want to find like yeah go on our website amplitudevc.com uh so investing broadly you know in in therapeutics mostly in canada uh so unfortunately i'm, I'm sure I'll put most of your listeners are in the u.s but you know we will be investing i think more in the u.s in the in the coming years with the coming funds just because you know strategy and focus area we have to be focused on where we are right now um but yeah i mean like you know if if there are questions or things that you know are unclear uh yeah you know you can find me sort of on linkedin uh just look, look up my name and, and sort of happy to answer questions but yeah Layton, i just really wanted to thank you and, and really appreciate the time and and yeah hope, hopefully this was a good conversation because I really enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.